you guys all like to see what pins I'm wearing, so uh, these might be relevant today. Wow, this video was late. Hi guys, it's Leanne and I am here today with my tops and bottoms for, what was last month? May? Is this June? Nah. And I have to say, that's how I feel in general right now, this last few days. Just, nah. Nothing I read last month particularly hit the sweet spot. It's weird because the older I get, the better I get at picking books, right? So I narrow down every year what specific things I like in each genre. And you know what specific things I don't. And as a result, the tendency is that I have less duds. Or at least that's the theory. I mean, there's always going to be those times where you take a chance on a book because you think, mm, that's not but it sounds kind of interesting or you're trying something new it's a different genre but in general I think as readers who read critically and often we tend to narrow down our prospects excuse you I'm trying to make a profound point here and I wonder if it's because I have got so good generally at picking books for myself that when I have a month where I don't have even one five star book, I kind of feel like I'm losing my touch. I find it even sadder when I come out of a month and I can't remember what I've read at the end of it because just... So on that note, let's talk about the one real standout that we had this month, shall we? It should come as no surprise to you guys by this point in my journey with my stack at TBRs that I fail every month to account for enough audiobooks to get me through an entire month. But that happened to be fortuitous this month because my top top of the month, the, the name and lights book, was The Amityville Horror by Jay Anson. Which is interesting because I always said to myself that I was never going to bother reading this because I had read enough journalistic accounts of it that I felt like I knew the whole story already and I just didn't need to revisit it. Boy was I wrong! So in case you know you avoid spooky real accounts of paranormal activity in which case how come you're still here? But in case you do, the Lutz case happened in 1975 when George and Kathy Lutz and their very young family moved into a house in Amityville which was a deal. It, this, is, this is a thing that I look out for in real life now. If there's ever a deal on a property that I think is too good to be true, I'm gonna go with my gut and say that there's probably a poltergeist there and I'm not gonna buy it. Mm -mm. No, no, don't necessarily believe in it, but I'm gonna avoid it anyway because better safe than sorry, bitches. It turned out that the year before in 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. had butchered his entire family with what I think was a sawn-off shotgun. All of the family members were found in their bed, very much dead, in positions which suggested that they were all asleep when Ronald killed them, which, I mean, I'm a sound sleeper, but I'm still pretty sure I would hear a sawn-off shotgun. So, this had all happened and nobody in Amityville wanted to buy the house because they were all sensible people and then the Lutzes walk in and George Lutz was a contractor and so he thought mm, no, I can I can I can make something of this turn the creepiness into something good no the Lutz family lasted 28 days before literally fleeing in the middle of the night and the clothes that they had on their back and refusing to return to the house because they said that there was something evil there. What Jay Anson then did in 1977 was from a series of interviews he did with the Lutzes and from the research that he did surrounding the people who were involved with the case, he published a semi-fictional account of what happened at that house in Amityville. So this book hit a lot of really good notes for me really early on because it is that kind of it's almost a non-fiction book you're definitely being told 
everything that the Lotuses are doing, you're never getting anything from their perspective. It always feels like there's an omniscient narrator somewhere. I guess it's because it kind of had one foot in true crime and one foot in horror. And I love horror accounts that are based on real events. One of the things that I usually hate about real event novels is that they're like too overly emotional. They're too overwrought. They're too... Uh, I don't know. They want to convey the horror in such a way that it's like... Oh, stop screaming and do something about it, Sally. But because this one was kind of a non fictiony true account fictionalization it worked really really well i really liked it read this one i i'm not kidding when i say that my lovely wife helen sometimes escorts me to the bathroom to pee in the middle of the night because i freaked myself out with horror books so much but i'm not gonna stop let's let's be honest let's talk about a bottom for the month i had another creepy book that was actually on my tbr for whatever month last month was, probably me, who knows. And I was really looking forward to it and it just meh. And that book was sadly The Silent Companions by Laura Purcell. I just, I had such high hopes for this one guys. This is about a woman whose husband has died under semi-mysterious circumstances. It's set in the Victorian era. She is already pregnant quite quickly after they got married. She's not particularly flavour of the month with his family and she has subsequently been sent to his old family estate that she's only just found out about to have her baby and be out of everybody's way. She is completely in the middle of the moors and the, when we say family estate I'm not talking Pemberley here you know I'm talking like cobwebs. It, it should have been creepy. It starts the very first chapter is set in a sanatorium and I was excited because I was like oh why are we here? This, this was unadvertised. I felt a little bit like I was rereading the beginning of Alias Grace by Margaret Atwood and this one paled in comparison and I didn't enjoy Alias Grace that much. So that's saying something. The writing was not gripping. The main character, I understand why she felt the way that she did, but she was so freaking whiny. Just moany, moan, moan, moan about everything. And I just, shush. Just, you you have found yourself in these circumstances. They are horrible circumstances. I am not by any means saying do not cry or do not complain, but don't do it on every single page. And so I never even got to the bit in the book where she finds the silent companion which is like a creepy carving silent wood carving thing and I don't know see this is the weird one I dnf this because I was like I don't care and I'm not compelled to pick it up and it's sitting on my nightstand and I, I don't I don't care. I would rather reach for 10 other things. But there's still a part of my nose that's bothered by the fact that I didn't get to find out what happens in this story. And it's quite an easy page turner, I guess. So, ugh, I don't know. I'm going to hold off on unhauling it now, just for a minute. Just for a little minute to see whether I go back to it. Maybe I try it again at Halloween. I wonder whether it was me. But I just, I was bored. Have any of you guys read this one? Can you guide me? Is this the kind of book that I'm eventually going to get into? Or should I just... I'm not actually going to throw it in case I keep this one. <laughs> Let's talk about another top. I have talked about this collection ad nauseum since I heard that it was coming out. I mean... I mean a lot. A real whole lot. I don't read a lot of poetry, but the poetry that I do read, I tend to get very passionate about. And there's a particular poetess that I'm thinking of at the moment who just can do no wrong with me, and that is Amanda Lovelace. This is The Mermaid's Voice Returns in this one, and it is the conclusion of her Women Are Some Kind of Magic, I think, series. 
which is three separate collections of semi-memoir-ish poetry which is very easy to jump into and very emotionally high impact. The series kind of chronicles Amanda's journey with sexual abuse and abusive relationships and also getting to know her own body and getting to understand where she fits in a world full of women, none of whom she looks at and thinks that person is like me. She also talks quite a lot about what it feels like when she realises that as a woman she has less privileges than a man does. Oh, I, I love, I love these poetry collections so much. People slam them all the time because they are Instagram poetry and okay let's let's have a rant as if we haven't already bitched in this video. I get really annoyed with people who suggest that poetry needs to be highbrow and pretentious and flowery and very sort of existential and conceptual and up here somewhere to be enjoyable or be worth anything. It really annoys me. I started studying poetry with Byron Keats and Shelley just like a lot of other people who studied literature did and none of those guys <laughs> wrote poems that were inaccessible and guess what? Those people are now famous. They did a new thing Nobody liked it at the time because they were called lowbrow and flowery and uh, worthless and ha 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 it's many years later and we're still studying them in our universities so <laughs> there is absolutely nothing wrong with a poetry collection being very straight forward. Amanda also uses form on the page a lot so if you are capable of picking up a physical copy of this one even if you you know get somebody to read it aloud to you because these poems also sound wonderful read aloud I would say do it because the actual form on the page gives so much more I wholeheartedly approve okay we'll do the other bottom so that we finish on a top this gets worse every time I say it out loud. This one was one that took me by surprise and actually made me really sad because I thought I was going to like it a lot more than I did. It had a lot of hype which makes me ultimately suspicious about fiction but in memoir it doesn't often then turn out that the hype has been overplayed. So yeah I definitely judged this one wrong. This is When I Hit You by Mina Kandasamy and it is a memoir about domestic abuse. It's a memoir about not being in an arranged marriage but very much a culturally accepted version of a marriage very very quickly and then being removed from your family. And she has had a fairly hard go of it in her first relationship ever. She was essentially a politician's behind the scenes lover who he would never actually go on to admit to knowing or being with. And that was very very difficult for her to accept and as a young woman it gave her certain expectations of where she was allowed to put herself and how valid her feelings were and where in the hierarchy she came. It's really difficult to say I disliked somebody's memoir because a lot of people feel like what you are then saying is I dislike this person and their experiences and I don't think that they're valid. So let's get that out of the way right now. I am by no means saying that Mina's experience is not harrowing and is not completely valid and is not a very necessary thing for us all to read about. I am however saying that Mina's narrative style does nothing for me and Mina is also a poet 
and I think that comes across very very strongly in this but Mina is the kind of poet that I just discussed with my last book in that it's kind of just a word scramble and you're supposed to make some sort of sense of her pain through it and it's really difficult. The book starts out very very kind of straightforward I guess. We're thrown into the action as it were because she begins when she's already married and already being abused and we kind of hear her story backwards which I really love in a memoir. I really love when a narrative moves backwards and sort of unpicks from the crisis point how we got to this place and then picks up again to how we're going to get out of it or not as the case may be for some people. So I really liked that but I really disliked her choice of language. It was very flowery, it was very floaty. I got the impression that maybe it was a technique that she was using to sort of distance herself by how much this hurt her and to kind of add beauty to a situation which otherwise was very ugly and I get all of that but it didn't work for me. By about halfway through I was just like I don't know what you're saying to me anymore, I don't know where we are. It was getting so vague that I had no idea where we were in the timeline or which man we were talking about and then there started to be sections which were kind of less about her actual experience and more sort of musings on society and women in society and it's not that I don't think that those things are important or that they are not intrinsically linked to this kind of narrative but it does mean that I'm less invested in hearing about it. But that means, hooray, we get to end on a top. Unfortunately for all y'all, it's not a top that I can particularly give many details on because it's the third book in a series. So I will keep this as brief as I ever keep anything in any of my videos. That book is The Hollow Boy by Jonathan Stroud. This is book three in the Lockwood and Co series. I feel like every time I talk about this, you guys are probably just sitting there like, oh, here she goes again. I know what this is about, Leanne, just shut up. But there are new people and they might not know, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. This series is, uh, yeah, urban fantasy new adult series it's listed as upper end YA but don't believe it because some of the themes that are not appropriate for teenagers this is set in a world wherein ghosts have been gone for a long time and have returned and these ghosts are all different types of spectre, they all do different types of things and different types of haunting but they can only be seen by people who are sort of below the age of 18 or 19. After that you can still be harmed by them, uh, you just can't see them when they're doing it so you die quickly, messily. And so there are little agencies all around London, which is where we are, who all are ghost hunting agencies, but they're all run by adults using the children, uh, employing the children, employing the children and managing the children. Except that the Lockwood and Co agency is made up of three teenagers, none of whom are suitable <laughs> for any kind of bigger agency and all of whom are utterly adorable and they're completely uselessness. Just, it's, it's awful, it's bad, it's awful. I really love a lot of things in these books so I'm just gonna list them because I can't tell you about this one particularly. I love that the characters are not ever portrayed as perfect. They are deeply, deeply flawed and their flaws are all over the page and they're rubbed in each other's faces. It's a good time for your self-esteem because they do really stupid things. I also really love the variety of types of character that we meet in Jonathan Stroud's books because although the three teens who run this agency are our main characters, so to speak, there are so many side characters of all different nationalities and privileged statuses and 
age and they, they interact with them so well and I never feel like Jonathan Stroud is talking down to the reader when he does that. I just, I love it. I love that the three of our trio are kind of the anti Harry Potter trio. They're all very different. We've got George who's a bit like Hermione except that he lives on donuts and sarcasm and absolutely does not want in any way to be in the thick of things and just wishes people would listen to him before they go charging in. But he can be quite an unpleasant person sometimes, can George. And so I, he's very un -Hermione like in that way. And I guess we have also got like a Ron and a Harry equivalent. But they are all much more multifaceted. They're all much more complicated. And in this one, we find out uh, the conclusion of a few of the mysteries that started way back in book one that have been kind of running along in the background. So there are five of these books and it is a completed series so that's another reason why I'm happy not happy. Question mark. I'm happy because I know that it's only five books and I don't have to race through the series to not be spoiled for new ones. I'm sad because there's only five books in the series and I want there to be more. But don't worry because the next two books in the series are on my TBR again for this month. So maybe, maybe this month I'll finish this series and you won't have to listen to me talk about it every video. Probably not. But... I didn't catch that. So those are all of my tops and bottoms guys. I just, I feel really the, the entire month can just be summed up by like, I don't know. It's, it's a bit like, uh, it's a bit like the last couple of seasons of Drag Race. Just like, I'm hoping that this month, which I, I believe is June, is going to bring me wonders and riches. Not seeing it so far. But, you know, that could change. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, my track record of things changing is so good. So, as always, guys, if you have read any of the books that I have mentioned here today, please tell me about it down in the comment section. And remember, if you didn't like any of the books, I would still like to hear about that too, because opinions live here. And on that note, I'm going to go and try and finish an audiobook that I've been listening to since the beginning of last month. You're probably going to see that in my tops and bottoms video soon. <sighs> like the next one, the next one that will be on time, like in just a couple of weeks because this one's late. Professional booktuber. I'll see you soon. Bye. They're just hanging on my every word. <clears throat> With each snore, I feel the love more. Mm-hmm. <laughs>